Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our excellence in casting panel, celebrating a few of the 2020 Ardios nominees. Yes, very exciting. Congratulations, everyone. To get started, will everyone go down the panel and introduce themselves and mention the project or projects they are nominated for? I'm Jamie Sparrow Roberts, and I am nominated for Frozen 2. I'm John Papsidera, and I'm nominated for Honey Boy. I'm Linda, I'm Linda Lamontane, and I'm nominated for Bojack Horseman. Uh, and I'm Seth Kasky, and along with Jen Houston and Elizabeth Barnes, we're nominated for Glow. Well, congratulations again. Those are all wonderful projects. Um, will everyone also share how they got into casting? To start us off. Go ahead, Seth. Yes. Well, how long do you have? Uh, so I started, uh, I moved to LA in 2006, uh, pursuing as a career as an actor. I'm a SAG member, still pay my dues. It was a, worked very hard to get that card, so I kept it. Um, <laughs> And then for a while, I actually worked here at the SAG Foundation. Um, Woo! Yeah, for uh, three years, I was um, part of helping set up the live stream program here. Um, and during that time, sort of to market myself as an actor, started volunteering. Um, it was back when casting could have unpaid interns. Uh, and was an intern with Debbie Menweller um, on the show 24, and then went to UDK and was a uh, intern there for uh, American Horror Story and really just kind of very much fell in love with the casting process and then, um, hello. Um, and then uh, I met Liz uh, about five years ago. We shared some studio space when I was running a self-taping business and I said, hey, if you ever need a reader or somebody to volunteer, I'm not always busy. <laughs> uh, maybe I could help you out. Literally the next day she emailed me. Um, she had gotten a commercial and her casting partner was going out of town. And so I went and I worked the hardest I've ever worked. Um, it was exhausting. It was so frustrating. I'd never dealt with agents and managers that way. I'd never looked at breakdowns from that side of the of things before. Um, and at the end of the week was wiped out and knew exactly what I wanted to do. Um, and Liz and I have been working together ever since. Anyone else want to share how they got into casting? And actually, now that we have the two editions on end, do you guys mind introducing yourself and saying the projects you're nominated for? Hi, I'm Mary Vernu. I'm nominated for Knives Out, uh, Palms, <laughs> Dolomite, and Bird Box. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lindsay Ahananu, Lindsay Graham, my former name, and I'm nominated for Dolomite with Mary. <laughs> And Mary and Lindsay, we were just sharing stories of how um, everyone here got into casting. <laughs> um, I was I interned at a talent agency for which which is now UTA, which was then Bauer Benedict, and I was doing that while I was in college and didn't really like that that much that side of the business. And I went to the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center for the summer that my sister was running and met someone who introduced me to Risa Brayman, and we worked together for seven years, and I, my first movie was The Doors as an assistant, and I wow. was like, is this a job? <laughs> 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 um, it was an amazing experience, and um, I just fell in love with, 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 do, you know, with meeting actors and discovering, you know, discovering uh, different people and talent, and you know, it was just a really great experience, so that was sort of how I got in. Um, I am from Texas. I majored in film at TCU, and I had to get an internship one summer. So I interned in Austin. Um, this girl who had graduated from TCU came and spoke at a freshman seminar and was speaking about casting, and I found it really interesting, sort of a balance of my type A personality of needing structure um, and really loving artists and actors. I grew up going to the movies every weekend with my parents, so I had a love for film. And took that internship in Austin, mostly commercials, really, really liked it. And moved out to LA without a job, as I'm sure many of you in this room maybe have done as well. Um, got an interview with Mary Vernu. Um, I was 22. And I, you know, I was trying to be an assistant 
you saying the agents and managers never working with agents and managers that I had no idea what I was doing honestly um, and Mary at the time was looking for a personal assistant and then decided not to hire a personal assistant and I just kept calling and calling and calling and being that person and I was like I will work for free because back then you could and they're like you start Monday so I came every day most interns came once a week a month later, sh month later, she hired me, and I've never left. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> um, I was saved. Uh, <laughs> I was working, let's see, I, I think I bounced around. I worked at um, what used to be William Morris many thousands, decades ago. Um, and then I worked at various um, film companies. And I decided after talking to one commercial casting director who asked me, because I worked in commercials and daytime serials when it was really popular, um, which still is, um, <laughs> but, but less. But um, I, the casting director, I told them that three gals we had, and she, she was like, they're not beautiful enough. And I'm like, Arr. all right, that's it. And I, I wanted to be able to be free and go after anybody. And I decided I wanted to be in casting. And so I left a stack of resumes. This is before computers, I'm really old. Um, and I got a call by an incredible person by the name of Karen Weiss, if anybody remembers her. She was amazing. She did moonlighting. She's the best person in the world. She gave me my start, and I stayed with her for a very long time until I um, broke off on my own. And uh, that's kind of how I started. So, John. Okay, it's my turn. Um, so I, um, I studied as an actor and went to... Um, a circle in the square in New York for postgraduate um, studies and um, and then I worked in restaurants forever and uh, <coughs> and I knew that once I got out of graduate school I, I went to a commercial audition for a diet Pepsi commercial that was a takeoff on Top Gun and um, I can remember sitting in that booth with cameras pointed at me and I thought yeah, okay, I can't do this. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, so, um, uh, although I was waylaid through restaurants and running restaurants in this country and, and in London, I, uh, I moved out to L.A. and um, was running restaurants but decided uh, I, didn't, I knew I didn't want to be an agent. I knew I didn't want to be in development. And uh, one of my best friends in college was in casting and... He said, well, maybe you'd like it. And so I went for an interview uh, and I met Stanley Sobel, who used to run the taper and uh, Mark Taper Forum. And I started as an intern there and Stanley offered me a job two weeks later. And then um, I stayed at the taper for a few years and then started an independent um, uh, casting and finally went out on my own when I did uh, the original Austin Powers. So. Uh, that really dates me. <laughs> Was the doors before Austin Powers? No. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank God. Maybe the same time. Um, I have an older sister who uh, always wanted to be an agent uh, from very young age. I don't know why, but um, she became an agent while I was still in college, and my parents made her boss me into getting a job. <laughs> and she got me a job while I was in college working for a management company, and I really loved the managers that I worked for at a company that's now called Framework, but I did not love management. And uh, when I graduated college, they offered me a full-time position at the management company, and I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, what do you want to do? And I said, I really love working with actors, but I hate this part. And so they said, why don't you try casting? And I said, okay. And they got me a job working for a casting director right out of college. Um, I worked for Marsha Shulman, my first pilot season out of college. I worked on five pilots. And I'd never worked in casting in my life. And it was nuts. But I fell in love with it. And I love working with actors at the best 15 minutes of their day. They come in and they're happy to see me. And they're, they're hopeful. And they have all this opportunity. And then they perform for me. Sometimes they sing. Sometimes they're funny. And then they say bye. And, 
And they leave, and if they have any complaints, they tell somebody else. <laughs> and so here I am, 23 years later, and I work, I've worked in live action, in television, in film, and I've been a studio executive, and the last uh, 12 years, I've gotten to be at Disney on staff, and it's the best job ever. Yeah. Well, thank you all for sharing. It's so incredible to see where you started, and now here you are nominated for the Ardios Award, so it's incredible. Um, will you all share how you got involved with the projects that you're nominated for? <laughs> <laughs> Um, for Dolomite, we have a great relationship with John Davis, and he was one of the producers, or the primary producer on this film. And he brought it to us after Eddie was already attached, and I mean, it's pretty, we've worked with John, we've done some TV with him, we've did, was it American Hustle or Joy? Um, Joy with David O. Russell, and we continue to do a lot of great things with him. We had never worked with Craig before or with Eddie, so that was exciting. Um, for Knives Out, uh, I've worked with Ryan Johnson. Well, Lindsay and I both have. Lindsay didn't get to do Knives Out because she was on maternity leave, <laughs> having the cutest baby you ever saw. Um, and so we did, you know, I worked on Looper with him and Star Wars, so that could just that relationship continues. Um, and Dolomite and Bird Box. Um, the producer is Clayton Townsend, who actually was the producer on The Doors. So that goes back to that. Um, so it really, full circle. Um, and Palms, um, Kelly McCormick and I have worked together on um, uh, Atomic Blonde. And so that's how that, that came about was through her. Uh, this business very much is you work with people you know, like, and trust. And Jen Houston, uh, who is a casting director in New York, uh, has worked with Jenji Cohen, our, one of our EPs on GLOW, for many years. She's sort of Jenji's casting person. And so they were putting together GLOW, and Jen came out here to uh, work on the pilot and do all of the series regulars in the first season. Wasn't going to stay in LA. The show was going to shoot here. And so Jen and Liz had worked together many years ago um, at Liebman Patton, and they became friends. And when Jen needed someone locally to sort of handle the day-to-day -day for GLOW, she reached out to Liz, and I was Liz's assistant on the, at the time, and she promoted me to associate when we took on GLOW. Um, my relationship on, uh, for BoJack Horseman started uh, with uh, Tornante Company, Michael Eisner, uh, Noel Bright, Steve Cohen. I worked with them on a show called Glenn Martin DDS, which was a stop motion animated series on Nick at Night, just kind of buried. It was great, but it didn't last very long. Um, <laughs> but uh, when they started developing BoJack, um, they asked me if I would come aboard, and here I am. <laughs> uh, I got a phone call. <laughs> That's so I mean, funny, I, I did too, yeah. from this girl, Elsa, yeah. and she's yeah. like, hey, I'm gonna go take a ride into the forest, and I need somebody to help me find some new friends. There it is. I'm a carrier pigeon. Right. You've all been singled out for your excellence in casting. How do you find that perfect fit for each role? Yeah, I'll start. I mean, I think it's a, um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a process, you know, um, for me anyway. I mean, it's a, I think for all of us, it's a process of trying to marry what it starts for me with reading something on a page and trying to marry a, a soul to that, you know, something that is um, two dimension on a page that you want to add a third dimension to. So it's about matching that with actors that you know and actors that you meet. Um, and it's a process, you know, I might see the role one way, the director, producers might see it another way, the studio has another, you know, agenda. And so it's a process of amalgamating all of that and trying to um, make it make sense at the end of the day. I mean, really, it's a lot of lobbying to get everybody on one page and to see it the, the same way. So it's not always as easy as, oh, there's a lock and there's the key and it's perfect. It is, it is a process about trying to narrow the field and fit everybody's you know, demands into one choice. 
That's an amazing description. Yeah. <laughs> it's exactly, it yeah. is. It's all, it's the process. The process is everything in casting. When and I you, think it's a process that's different per project, per role. Yeah. I mean, it's never the same process. Twice. Yeah, and in again fact, and on Honey Boy, the director had come from, she'd only really done documentaries and kind of art pieces, which were amazing and beautiful, but never really had done a scripted film. And, and I think some, somehow the call came because I knew Shia for years. I had put Shia in Dumb and Dumberer. He doesn't even have it on his resume anymore. <laughs> so... Um, uh, he was in a mascot outfit most of the time. Um, and so somehow that came to me, but um, uh, where did I start? What was that conversation? What was that? I don't even know what I was saying now. Oh, I got uh, Dumb and Dumberers on, on to the table. That's the end of it. Um, uh, no, so I think that, you know, that process of she wanted to really see real people. She wanted only to cast real people casting. And, um, and so we sat and we talked and she was like, yeah, I'd love to. And literally she was like, I want to go walk the streets and look for hookers. And I want to go walk the streets and look for people that could play this role. And I, and I walked out of the meeting and I said to the producers, yeah, okay, I can't do that. I said, you know, I mean, I, I have a company to run and I can't spend my days walking around. And at the end of the day, <laughs> At the end of the day, no, seriously, Mary doesn't oh, believe I, me. I, yeah, you believe I me. I do believe you. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and at the end of the day, I, you know, I mean, how the Noah Jupe thing even came about. Noah's the, the, the kid in, in Honey Boy, and um, who was fantastic. It's incredible. And, yeah. And um, yeah, Noah was great. But it was a lot of work convincing her that. You know, there was another kid that we had seen, a, a real person casting director in New York had found this kid literally in a playground. And and she was like, yeah, I'm not sure. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, there's no comparison. Like, you're gonna, you're telling a story. Have an actor tell that story. And you know, I think it's a real, I mean, a, I do think it's a real dilemma these days. I'm going to sidetrack now. Sorry, it's not, it's not on no, the No, it's great. Script. It's all so fascinating. Um, in that, I was having a conversation with a casting director that I've done uh, multiple, a uh, couple of Chris Nolan films with. And Inception we did together and, and Dunkirk we did together mostly. And I called him out of the, thanks, I called him out of, uh, out of the blue just to see how he was. And he's in London and... He called me back and he said, I just want you to know I'm done. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, I'm done. He said, I cannot do this anymore. I can't have these conversations about who is the best trans actor, who is the best, um, you know, fill in the blank actor. Um, and he's like, it's like we're casting reality television. It's not like we're, or films. It's not like it's about talent anymore. And, um, and I do think, I mean, I find in my business, it is, um, it's a dilemma, you know, um, and I'm not sure, you know, I, I absolutely agree that people should have access and, and opportunities and all those things. But at the end of the day, you're telling a story. And at the end of the day, actors have skills. And, um, and you know, if a gay actor can't play a straight role or vice versa, then really it's, it's suddenly about your DNA and it's suddenly about socially who you are, not necessarily what your skills are. And so I don't know, I don't know how you guys find, find it, but it is, um, it's increasingly difficult. Anyway, Honey Boy, I convinced her to use an actor and I thought Noah was amazing and I, you know. And, he was, and, he was absolutely yeah. amazing. Um, now you mentioned Noah. I'm sure you've all had a similar experience where you found an actor and thought that's the right choice. Can you articulate that gut feeling? It's euphoric. <laughs> I'm serious. There's a show that, um, I think for Bojack Horseman, but there's another show that I did that I'm really super proud of because it's a rotoscope animation and I had to cast like live action. And I used to do it back in the day, but for some reason I'm now known for animation. But um, everybody in that show, and it's only eight episodes on Amazon, but even down to the extras, and it was everybody from Buddhist monks, try to get a Buddhist monk to go on camera, <laughs> to Tamil-speaking families, um, which is a, a 
portion, a small region of India, and everyone had to speak Tamil. So I was at Malibu temples, sliding notes to people um, um, in, in temple. I'll probably be in hell for that. Um, but uh, but it, it's it's an amazing feeling. Like when Rosa Salazar came in and read it, and we'd been searching and searching, and, and I was literally, I, I'm a sad sap. Tears are rolling down the side of my face when I feel that performance. And I really do feel the performances. And, and I'm sitting there crying like a sap in the corner. But it's, you feel it in your body when you know it. And you know it's them. And you just, and it, I had that feeling of pretty much on everybody on that cast. Bojack was a little different because a lot of that was offer only uh, in the beginning. We did do auditions, but we ended up making offers to people. And, and we were fortunate because usually our first choices said yes. I think only one we didn't, but I'm not going to disclose. But we were very happy with that cast. Um, so it's euphoric. Um, I could talk about Dolomite with divine Joy Randolph, who played oh. Lady Reed. Also incredible. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, to say that again? Oh, I said we honored her last night. Oh, y'all did? Oh, yeah. she's that. so lovely. Um, you know, if you have seen Dolomite, you notice it's a very male-heavy cast, um, and she's the only female, and obviously has to hold the screen with Eddie Murphy and a lot of iconic men, and she was also a real person, so we really wanted to do the real Lady Reed justice, and um, we saw everyone, we went through a lot of, we saw everyone, and we, you know, there's the usual suspects of casting a name, which we could have easily done because luckily it was a film that a lot of people were interested in doing, but our team was very open to us just going through a process. And um, Craig had worked with Divine on Empire. He had directed an episode of that. So they had, a, they had met before, which was lovely. And when Divine came in, she was younger than the real Lady Reed was in the original um, Dolomite, but it just clicked, right, Mary? Yeah. It was it was crazy, and and she went through a serious process. I mean, we I think read her four or five times, hair and makeup tests. Um, it was a very grueling process for her as an actress, and it was just one of those things that when when she got it, you just <laughs> you know you wanted to cry because you it was such an opportunity for her, and I think she did the part. I mean, everyone was talking about her, you know, she's, she really stood out amongst such a wonderful, you know, ensemble of solid actors, so it was exciting. Does anyone else have a particular actor or character in these projects that they stand out as particularly proud of that casting choice, or one that you look and you think, that's the one that I'm... You know, like know us to entail. I think when, in addition to a divine fern on Knives Out, um, Anna de Armas was, um, was, that was the search on that movie. Um, and we saw everyone and she was in Africa and was like, we couldn't get her back. And literally like we had seen everybody and I just said, you have to wait for her. She had d done a tape, but it wasn't that great. And I just said, I just had a really strong instinct that I, that, that she was the one. Um, and Ryan didn't want anybody who was too pretty, and she's beautiful. So, um, but I said, she can do it. She can, you know, she can strip down, and she can, you know, and she flew in the last weekend before we had to cast the part and um, and read and got the part, and it was so exciting because I just, I just had, a, I'd known her from other auditions, and I just knew it was, she had what it, she had all of the characteristics of what, you know, that character needed to be, and she got it, and it was so exciting. And the yeah, exactly. It's really exciting for her. She's doing well. I guess for Glow for season two, um, Shakira Barrera, uh, she plays the character of Yo-Yo. She was our new series regular that we were adding um, in season two, and, and our producers had a very specific idea of what they wanted that character to be. They wanted a Latinx character, they wanted someone who was a rapper, and they wanted someone who was a break dancer. And if you watch our show, and all of the wrestling, it, 99.9% .9 of the wrestling on our show is done by our actors. So they are a very physical cast that we knew that if they asked for a break dance for them, this person was going to have to dance. Um, and so as the process goes, we read a bunch of women. And um, I had worked on a, a pilot the year before 
which is where we met Shakira. And she came in and she was still training at the time and she just wasn't quite ready to be a series regular. She was a very talented actress. She was older for the, the, for the role that we were casting on that show. Um, and she just wasn't quite there yet. Um, but then we brought her in for Glow and the minute she walked in the door, like you just knew it was her. She also happens to be a professional dancer that we didn't know that going into it and then that was sort of what helped us be able to convince our producers that this was the this was the actor for the part um so that a perfect storm of stuff that came together i guess that's kind of how the feeling is it's the perfect storm of it just it just it's like connect four it's like it all just boom falls into place and it makes that's how <laughs> maybe i'm dating myself on that one i don't know <laughs> It would be really hard for me to pick one particular um, cast member that I'm the most proud of, but I feel like, I, um, because my movie is a sequel, that uh, Josh Gad is really the gift that keeps on giving. Um, from the inception of the idea of this project, from way before Frozen, the first Frozen was even called Frozen, we had a table read when it was just a very rough draft of the script when it didn't look anything like the original Frozen. He came in, I, I mean, this story is even too ridiculous to repeat, but he came in and read at the table read for us as a favor and read the Olaf character, which doesn't resemble anything like the character of Olaf does now. But from that moment when he came in, it was just like he breathed life into the character. And in that moment, it became this iconic snowman that's never going to leave anybody's minds ever again <laughs> and just will live on in history. And I think that... I'm proud of the rest of the cast as well, but I think that one is the one that probably sticks out the most in my head. What I heard from a few of you was that you had to fight for those actors to be cast. Is that common? Do you find yourself fighting a lot for your choices? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I thought she was going to say, someone was going to say something. Um, I don't, you know, I don't necessarily think that it's fighting. I think it's persuading. And I think it's building a case of why and how you see it. And, you know, knowing actors um, probably better than the people involved in the process um, and knowing a body of their work and, you know, knowing them over years and a lot of different reasons why. It, it's a lot about dramaturgy and figuring out what those characters are and what, you know, what attributes actors bring to those. So I think it's more about, I mean, I've, I've certainly worked with um, other casting directors that look at it as a fight in my own career coming up, um, and they burned every bridge they ever had. Um, so I don't necessarily think it's a fight as much as it is um, g convincing people, you know, making a, a case for it and proving those points. This is how I look at it. This is also a unique group of people up here who have built relationships with a lot of the filmmakers mm. that they work with, and yeah. they're fortunate in that the filmmakers trust them to bring them the goods each time, so the fight probably isn't there as much, I would think, right? Yeah. yeah. But I would also say, like, there is, there does, on the flip side of that, you also have to be willing to let go of it being, yeah. you have to let go of being stubborn about it because yeah. at the end of the day, it's ultimately not your decision right. and it's not your show yeah. and you can build the best cases you can respectfully, yeah. but then also let it go. Yeah. <laughs> let it go. <laughs> Do you like what I did there? I know we we're all dying to say it, right? <laughs> I also think that actors evolve too. Like, you know, as he said, this person wasn't, you know, at that stage ready to be a series regular, but then they came back another time and they grew. And, and I've learned my lesson um, because I, I, I have a really, I'm open to our policy. If you can find me, you can audition because I do voiceover. It's a little easier for me. You can self-record and send it to me. So, um, and I let that know, be known to a lot of people. So they found me and they have literally emailed me and I've sent them sides to audition. But, um, I lost my point. <laughs> well, it happens. Well, it's my know. It just yeah. went right out the fighting. window. Fighting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah well, uh, yeah. Well, a lot of uh, there has been a couple of times where I've said to the producer, "Look, if you don't like this person, you can fire me. I'm telling you right now, this is the person." And, and, and but it's worked. 
<laughs> and I've won, and they did a great job. So, but those are the ones I really, you know, I, that's the crying moment, and you feel it, and you're euphoric, and you know that's the winner. So I don't do it often, but I, I have been known to do that. But that's, that's my tiny little fight. Most of the people, they usually agree, or they say, oh, we like this other person, Linda. Let's go off this. So I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> Linda, so. do you hire people without meeting them in person? Um, yeah, really? some, so a lot because sometimes they're across the country. Right. Um, you know, the, uh, there's one kid I put on Clarence who auditioned in Chicago, got the job. Fortunately, his dad was a doctor, so he could afford it. Um, and I said, you know, if you come here, this is a good opportunity because you can probably get something else. And he ended up getting the Goldbergs afterwards so he's he's on that and then it became really difficult for them to get um but yeah no a lot of people i don't i don't see in person and then uh, now i do a lot of skype records so um because that seems to be easy for people they don't have to leave their house and and then i can direct that way so but a lot of it is i, I rely on them to have good instincts to find the comedy and the material because you can't coach everybody through a table read so they have to be, you have to be prepared. You have to n know your craft. You have to know, you know, the material. I tell people all the time, especially if somebody's new and they're trying it out, I say, you know, blindfold yourself and watch your favorite cartoons because I you work in animation and listen to the tone, listen to the rhythm, listen to how they're delivering. And, and the people that do actually do well. Joe Walsh is one. Joe Walsh almost got this one project. I'd end up going to a guy named C.W. Stone King out of Australia. He was brilliant, but he, did his homework and he was second runner up for that part and it, it turned into like a Tome of the Unknown, which I think ended up winning an Emmy eventually. Um, it was a dark horse. As most of you have worked with the same people again and again, whether it's on a show for multiple seasons or with a studio or a director again and again, how has your process changed with them over time? Aside from the trust and being able to, yeah. And I think you get a shorthand with them, or you start to understand, you know, a, a lot of our job is dependent on our taste, but you, the longer you work with uh, a, a producer or a director, you start to understand their taste. So as you're bringing actors in, you kind of, you, part of that gut feeling is, oh, they're gonna respond to this person, or I love them, but they're just not, I know that Liz and Carly are probably not gonna, does that make, if that makes sense, like it's, you get to understand so that makes the, it gives you a shorthand or a way to talk to each other that you can anticipate um, who they're gonna to respond to. Those of you who cast projects that film outside of LA, can you walk us through the working relationship with Locals Casting? Locals Casting is very important. Um, and I think it's really important that they have the same taste that you have and they, they understand that it's also a process. Um, so it's like you, you try to find people in each city who you really like and trust. And there's great people all over. So it's, it's we, we find, mm -hmm. we, we, you know, we do a lot of movies that don't shoot here, because actually, except for Dolomite, which had 99 parts <laughs> that shot in LA. <laughs> um, so we, you know, it, it, I think it's, you know, the local casting, are, they're so key um, in, in helping. You know, because one line roles are almost harder to do than big parts. Mm -hmm. I have a question from Ashley. She wants to know, have you ever been blown away by an audition or have one that just absolutely stays with you? In a good way or a bad <laughs> way? <laughs> Hopefully good. Oh, yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. Where's, Where's Ashley? <laughs> Let's keep it positive. Do you have one that really sits with you and you, when I asked the question, just came to the front of your mind? I see Linda nodding. Yeah, okay. This goes way back. Um, so I worked on Roseanne in the early days, and I'll never forget, I, I used to read with the actors, which I'm not great at it, but um, I remember Danton Stone came in, and it, it, that room was very quick. You had to just get in, audition, exit. They didn't like small talk. And I remember Danton just started talking about a tree. And I'm like, what is he doing? We're in the middle of this audition. We've got to get through this. And then I realized... It was the dialogue. And you can literally see it in my face. I'm like, oh, okay. Look at the sides. Okay. And I didn't mess up his audition. He did get the role as a recurring role, but he was so real that I really thought he was talking about a tree in the backyard. <laughs> so 
Never, n we'll never forget that audition. <laughs> I'll tell one. Okay. Um, we were reading uh, kids for another, it wasn't on GLOW, it was for a different project we were working on. Um, we were looking for seven-year-old kids, and so we'd seen a bunch throughout the day. And this little boy comes in, and he didn't have a ton of credits on his resume, but he was this, this little ball of sunshine, so happy, like so adorable. So the scene was that it was, took place in a hospital and the kid had gotten burned. And so I was like, okay, are you ready to, are you ready to go or ready to start? And he said, okay. And he turned around. Like in, a, in the audition room, just turned around. 20 seconds. <laughs> 45 seconds. It was a good minute and a half. And Elizabeth, our, my assistant, was, we were looking at each other going, okay, should we say something? Turns around, bawling. The kid is like sobbing comes and sits down in the chair, does the scene, like I'm down on the floor with him, we're doing the thing back and forth. He gets up, okay, anything else? <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> it, 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 we still talk about it in the office, like this kid was just amazing. He didn't get the part though. Was that was the bad thing. We were so sad, we were so sad. Like he did not, they ended up casting an, a, another actor. But he has gone on, I just saw on Instagram the other day, he booked 911, so Yay. I'm very happy for him. <laughs> So he booked the room. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just one story. I mean, this is years ago too, but um, uh, I was doing a uh, a film, and um, we had read so many actresses in town for this role, and was opposite John Goodman, and it was in a speech, and he was um, uh, he was giving a speech to a secretary. It was one of the audition scenes, and every girl came in and took as it was in the script took dictation and either they brought a pad or they had a pad or they pretended like there was a pad and <clears throat> and took notes and Anne Heche came in and read and Anne's choice was that she was so smart she just sat and listened to him <laughs> and then got up and walked out and came back with the letter and it, I mean as for an actor it was such a smart choice that that actor made that everybody in the room was like whoa like nobody even considered that that was a unique choice and it was you know I, I talk to actors about it all the time like if you can find moments to make unique choices that separate you from other people that is you know it's it's diving into the work and it's being you know, respectful and adding your own creativity to something that wasn't there necessarily on the page. And um, it's moments like that. Like, I don't remember the bad, there's tons of bad ones. I don't really remember the bad ones as much <laughs> as moments where I think and I feel like I'm in the presence of an artist. And those are the moments that stick with me. I still get chills even when I say that because I think of it in that way. Um, so I, I think for actors and talking to actors and, and SAG, it's important to you know look at the material that way and how can you separate yourself from other people? Not by making crazy, stupid choices, <laughs> but by making smart, intelligent, thought out choices that is not what everybody's gonna do in the room. That actually reminds me of uh, one of my favorite auditions that I thought of when you were saying making choices. Um, I Auditions are my favorite part of being a casting director. There's a lot more that goes into it besides sitting there and judging people's performances. Um, but uh, Nick Offerman came in for us uh, for a musical once. He actually sings pretty well. And he, um, he rewrote the words to a song that um, he performed for us. He brought his own guitar and I don't listen to country music much, but I guess there's a song called Jesus Takes the Wheel. And he, um, this was for a children's movie, and he rewrote the words and sang Jesus Takes the Weed for us. <laughs> and <laughs> the words were so funny, but I, I was drinking I, probably a Diet Coke while he was singing and shot whatever it was out of my nose. <laughs> I've never laughed so hard in my life, but that was one of those moments where he made a choice, and it was honestly the funniest audition that we saw for weeks. So there you go. A great audition, very memorable. Uh -huh. Aside from making strong choices, what are other ways that actors can be successful in the room? Mary? <laughs> um, I just think it's good to come in with a good attitude and to be, you know, prepared and you know, not, and just 
have a good good energy you know just come in and you're you know you're in the room you're you have your moment and you know sometimes there's so many reasons why people don't get a role and most of them don't have anything to do with you they have to do with everything else and so i always just think that the most important thing is to just be in a really good headspace and leave it in the room because don't you find that people walk in talking themselves out of the job yeah, before like, they and even remembering start the last audition. one and why they didn't get it and or even just walking and in like, and saying oh i just i'm just sorry i'm like i just got these i, I you know like I, I, i'm really sorry like i know it's not it's not going to be that great but like uh, just bear with me for a second or like if you need me to do it again i'll do it again like isn't, doesn't yeah. that happen a lot? Yeah. It's like, just okay, let's just relax. You didn't even do anything yeah. yet. Let's just take yeah, a step Yeah, I mean, back. I think it does. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I, you yeah, don't. It does come down to confidence. I mean, if there was one Definitely. thing I could give every actor walking into a room, mm -hmm. it's confidence. You know, um, it's palpable. You know, producers, directors, casting directors, you feel it. You know, somebody walks in with confidence, you want part of that. You know, you it, it translates in the room. And so I think that's the thing that I would, you know, uh, ask or, or want for every actor is to be confident when they walk in a room um, and 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 be there, you know, not in the last audition, not after I leave and I screwed up, but to be there and be confident. Yeah. Remind yourself that we want you to get the job. I know want the next person hard. who comes in yeah. to book the job. That would nothing would make me happier. Is an essential part of that confidence being off book? No. 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 I mean, familiar with it, you know, yeah. if you, especially yeah. if you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, especially if you're taping and somebody's heads in the page the entire time. Yeah, look up a little bit, but you know what I mean. Yeah, no, I don't think you you have to be familiar with it. it yeah, it's totally unnecessary to be word perfect because yeah. we're not shooting the actual movie yeah. in that moment. And if we need to go back and correct a few words, guess what? We can do that. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes if you're if you're if you're too stuck in the way that you've yeah. memorized it, yeah. then you don't have the ability to change. And so I think it's important to be able to be able to play. You know, yeah. I think you take it as a place like if someone gives you direction, it's not that you didn't do it right. They want to see something else. And how can an actor capture tone? And is how essential is that to being prepared? You really just have to understand what it is that you're saying. Do you understand <laughs> what's on the page? You're laughing, but half of the time, yeah. not half. Sometimes when I'm reading with an actor, I get the picture that they really don't understand what's going on in the scene. and. I don't know if they don't want to ask or if they're afraid to ask or whatever. Because a, a lot of times when I sit down with an actor, the first thing I say is, do you have any questions before we start? Whether it's, do you want me to show you how to, or tell you how to pronounce a word or is anything unclear? Sometimes when I get a, some sides or material, I have no idea how to pronounce something. Maybe the word's not in the la my first language or maybe it's a made up word or maybe some of the concepts are unclear. It's fine to ask questions, especially if the casting director asks you, do you have any questions? But I get started with people sometimes and I can, it's clear to me they don't understand what's going on in the scene, which is fine. Let us explain it to you. Mm. Um, but I think tone, which is the most important part of can, the message and your ability to convey it is the whole, is what's behind being an actor. I don't know, that's my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> You've already mentioned a few, but what are some other ways that actors sabotage themselves in the room? I just got these sides. <laughs> <laughs> or they don't read the specs. Like I, when I put out breakdowns and I put out to agents, managers, and I actually go out any English speaking country on every project that I work on. And if it's an LA hire, I'll say it, but if it's not, I leave it open to anybody. But I write very specific direction on each character. I give the whole set aside so you can see all the other characters. I don't know if agents are not giving it all out to the actors, but if, if, if my name's on it, if you guys know it's me, tell your agent I want the whole package because it literally has an NDA, it's the specs, every character, character renderings and lines, and I always have my contact information on there too, so if there's a question, you can email me. 
um, and I'll answer it. So I, I, if there's a way, you know, just the thing is read. Like that's that's the thing. I, I'm not kidding you. Like all day yesterday, I've been emailing agents. Did you read the specs? You know, and it got bigger and more capitalized letters because it's all there. It literally has dates, everything listed, any piece of information, but they don't read it. So that's super key for me is like get as much material as you can and read everything. Can you see good acting through nerves? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you, uh, we understand that that's, awesome. that that's, we understand that, that, that actors are coming in the room with those nerves. You know, in our office, I'll speak for our office, you know, we have lovely, like, positive sayings up on the wall. We have a candle burning in the lobby. We usually have music. Like, it, we just try and make our office as chill. I mean, I was a former actor. Liz is married to an actor. Like, we understand where you guys are coming from, so we know that you're coming in with all of that mind chatter that you have in the car on the way over. Um, sorry, what was the question? Just, you, you I did it nerves. too. Nerves. 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 So, yeah. and, you got nervous. And, and I was, got nervous. Yeah, I did get nervous. Yeah. I know, because I don't like talking yeah. in front of I am nervous. I don't know why, but I am. We're all human. Um, Yes, we can see good. We can see good acting through nerves, um, and then we'll also give you another chance. Like if if it if you if the nerves just totally wreck the take, like our office always likes to give people the opportunity to do it again, get it out in the world one time, and then let's do the real thing. There's so many talented actors; they don't all book the part. What makes you want to bring an actor back? I think you should always bring people back. Mm -hmm. I'm a big believer in that. I think that people grow and change and everybody has a bad day, everybody has a good day. I mean, if you just said, oh no, they're not good and you never saw them again, you would never know that they, you know, people change and they mm -hmm. grow and they learn and you know, they get better actors. Every time they audition, they get better and better. And you know, we're a big believer. We always see people over and over again. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I um, mean, and, and you know, I spend so much of my time telling producers and directors and you know, studios, it's not an exact science. You know, it's exactly what you're saying. You know, somebody has a bad day, somebody just got in an accident, and then they hurry, hurried in to read, whatever that is. Um, yeah, I mean, part of the joy is for me as a casting director is when I meet somebody that day, I can love their work from the day I know them until the day I drop dead. You know, and and it doesn't change for me. They may be right for something, they may not be, but it doesn't change for me. The biggest, the biggest, um, and it's only happened to maybe two or three times, two people in my head, they'll say to me, oh, I never book in your office. And it puts this thing on me like, okay, I'm sorry, I'm bothering you then. Like, you know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, if anything, I'm, I'm bringing you back again and again because I believe in you and I, and I respect the actor that you are. And it's a weird reversal that I then go, okay, well, I don't, I shouldn't bring them back if, if, if they're not booking. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a give and take, you know, but I, I enjoy the relationships I have with actors over the years. And saying they never book in your office is like a self-fulfilling prophecy on their part. They're man, you know, you're manifesting that. Yeah. You're yeah, walking yeah, yeah. in with that in your brain. Yeah. So you won't ever. And I feel bad it. about it. Yeah, no. You know, you I feel bad. Yeah, but, <laughs> right. But, I mean, all I can do is provide the opportunity, exactly. you know. How important is diversity in your process, and how much freedom do you have to consider a wide range of actors for certain parts? <laughs> you want to touch that one? I have to. Yeah, so I think, it, I mean, we, are, we love to keep everything as open as we can. Obviously, there's certain material where you have to, you know, Dolomite is a perfect example. Um, it was very specific, so you're going you're gonna to honor that. But in most cases, I think we do our best to, like, why does this person have to be white or Latin or a man? Or why can't they be a trans, black, you know? woman or we, we do our best to always it's our job with our producers and directors and writers because they've sat with the material for so long to open their eyes and ask those questions and hopefully you know they are open to that if there's no reason it has to be something specific for story purposes in my experience mm -hmm. for years um, casting directors have been great advocates of diversity mm -hmm. that's the truth 
I want to touch upon self tapes because um, it's such an increasing trend right now in casting. Of the projects that we've mentioned up here tonight, was any of them cast via self tape or any roles cast on self tape? Ours wasn't because it was all cast in LA, but yeah. example going back to Skypes was like we did all of Silver Linings Playbook via Skype and self tape and in person. We did a whole lot of everything with that film because we never had David in person. He was working on the script across the country. And so everything was on video with that film. When you're doing a project on self tape or Skype or a medium where the actor is not in the room with you, how can an actor stand out? <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, I've had the conversation, sorry, man. I've had the conversation with, you know, many an actor that I'll look at something and go, well, it can be better, it can be done differently, it can, and, you know, I'm a big believer, and even though, you know, agents hate me for it, and my office to some degree hates me for it, but I'll say, have them retape, you know, give them notes and have them retape, or have them call me and I'll talk to them and give them notes and retape. But I also think, you know, because I've had this conversation with so many actors over the years of, you know, it is the one opportunity because so many people hate self-taping and, you know, it's now so common. It used to be less common back in the day. Um, but, you know, I would say to actors, you know, it's the one moment that you have absolute control over what I get to see. You don't walk into a room with somebody on their cell phone. You don't walk into a room and somebody's eating or they sneeze during your audition. You have absolute control over what you show. I mean, there's an actor that, um, that I've cast a couple of times that, you know, he never studied formally, lived in Texas. He literally would tape himself 40, 50 times uh, uh, an audition to just sit in front of it and see how he looked on camera and how he, you know, and he perfected how he actually works and what he does by doing that. And so I would encourage people not just to make it simple, you know, I'm in front, it's like headshots, you know, I'm in the middle of the frame and there's so much above my head and it's, I'm right in the center and like it speaks something about you. And not everybody's an auteur, not everybody's a director, um, but it's also you don't have to just sit in a blank room with a wrinkly sheet behind you and, and, you know, and, and give a standard audition. There's room for creativity, so use that moment to be creative. But make sure the sound is good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you wish more actors knew about the self-tape process? I think everything John just said, mm -hmm. yeah. What do you wish actors knew more about the casting process as a whole? That we actually do really watch and listen to everything, at least I, I, my, I, my office, it's me. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> in my bathtub. Um, but I, I literally do everything that shows up in my inbox I literally download, that's why I'm writing nasty emails going, read that Max. Um, um, I li literally do listen to every single audition that comes in. And, and I'm, you know, I will actually reach out to people and say, can you redo this with these notes and these notes? Or, or say, let's connect, you know, because if I've never connected with somebody in person before and I, I'll work with them and direct them on through Skype or the iPhone or whatever. And, and these things are great tools now. They're so much easier. The only thing is I always tell people, audio is super important. We need to hear you and it, can't, it shouldn't be in an ambient room, not up against glass. I tell people for audio auditions, a car is a fabulous thing. Like I think I went to Judy Greer's house one time and we parked under, or no, Monica Potter. We parked under a driveway in the dead of summer, ran the air conditioner in her, in her SUV, turned it off and then quickly she, we faced each other and I recorded her, she got the part. But, um, but it's important, the audio. Listen to, what you, listen to what you record before you send it to us and, and label it. That's, this, I have to say this because I'm like, really not happy about this. <laughs> People that don't label their crap, okay? Headshots come in with just their picture, no name on it, no file. How are we supposed to know who you are? <laughs> um, we can Google a picture, but it's, it's gonna take me a million years to figure it out, but, and I will. I, it will be the last thing I do. I'll hunt you down and say, you need to label your shit. Um, so, so, 
and that goes for audio files. Put your name on it. Somehow, some way to find you or representation. You know, I'm very picky, and I spell it all on the spec sheet. And I'm begging people, please read the spec sheet. Okay, that's my sorry. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. JPEGs are fine. Just shrink them. Not these big, massive things that you stick in the body of the email that you have to open up your screen and, and figure it out. But yeah, no, seriously, you you got to think about it. When you send something, we're we're getting a lot of submissions. And if your stuff isn't labeled, doesn't have your name on it, we can't find you. And it's going to go to the back of the pile to find you later to tell you you missed out because we couldn't find you. So, and, and just make yourself gettable. Like somewhere, IMDB on the secret page, put your contact information. But let, we need to be able to find you. That's my, sorry. Okay, yeah. We my got rant. Right. <laughs> sorry. And I know what bugs you. I know. Okay. <laughs> yeah, very good. Yeah. Doing it for days. We, we talked about it earlier and as part of this conversation, but I think just reiterating the fact for actors, the thing for actors to understand is that casting is a process and that that process looks different. And it's, you could come in and, and it's a collaborative process and you could come into our office, you could nail the audition and we're like, you are the person, we found them, they're it and producers pick someone else. Like it's a, it's, it happens. And so, you know, I think Tom Hanks said it at the, the, the I think it was the Golden Globes maybe, uh, be on time, know your lines, make a choice. Like those are the things that you can do and then let the rest of the process work itself out. I just wanna add to that. I think it's important for y'all to know that we're on your side. Mm -hmm. Um, I've heard so many horror stories. I'm sure a lot of you have had negative experiences in casting offices or with directors. You know, we've had directors who don't even look at the actor and that those things do happen. But I know in our office as in our profession, it's like we wouldn't be in this profession if we didn't have a love for artists. Um, and so we're here to help facilitate that and get you the part not to bring you down. So even if you have a negative experience, um, like Mary said earlier, or John, someone said, like, leave it in the room, because I would say at least 80% of us, you know, we, we do this every day because we do have a passion for what you do and helping bring that, you know, to fruition, to get that up there and, and get the best audition out of you and, and be your Biggest cheerleader. I was a cheerleader, so that's where my mind goes. Um, <laughs> um, but I do. I think it's important for, for you to know that we care. And we're all on the same team, is what I like to say. Because sometimes I feel like we're not. What, not us and you, but us and the agents and the producers. And everyone's fighting for something. But Before we run out of time, I want to make sure to get some audience questions in. Um, I have a question from Melina. Wants to know, what's the best way for us to submit and be seen by your office if we are not currently represented? Email me. We open all mail that comes in our office and it gets distributed to each casting director internally. If you see a breakdown, you're welcome to send us something. Nothing goes in the trash without being opened. Yeah, and actor's access is good too, on breakdown. Yeah. The follow-up question here is, what's the best way to contact you? <laughs> Aside from email, email me. Email <laughs> Sometimes, um, this one doesn't have a name. Um, oh, suggestions on how to get in more rooms when you have the experience but aren't on everyone's immediate list. <laughs> on everyone's immediate list. Oh, I'm sorry. Suggestions on how to get in more rooms when you have experience, but you aren't uh, yet on everyone's immediate list. I think like work on your craft. I think, you know, do theater if you can, you know, make your own place as an artist. And I feel like that that helps create an environment for you that brings you work. I don't know. I, I'm a big believer in, in, you know, you create you create your own path. So I think if you if you work on your craft and you keep you know you look at somebody like you know Phoebe Waller Bridge, who I was like talking to a London casting director, and she was like she's been kicking around for so long, you know, and this is like her success 
is amazing. And it's just because she's like, I'm going to write a one woman show and I'm going to put it on. And that's what she did. And that's where Fleabag came from. And she just kept working and working and working. And look where she is. I mean, it's just amazing. It's an amazing success story. A lot of people are creating their own content and putting it up on YouTube and then sending us emails with links to their content. And I get stuff daily, newsletters with people's links to their websites. I mean, you can. there's all kinds of ways to give us access to your work without us going to see you somewhere. Vimeo, TikTok. And I'll get woo-woo on it for a second. Don't uh, change the way you're thinking about that. Like, don't assume that you're not on my list. Like, I could see you, you could be in every submission that I look through, and I'm like, oh yes, I love them. I just don't have anything for you right now. There's not something to bring you in on. So trust that you're, you continue to do work on your craft, continue to make your own things, and trust that that perfect storm will happen at some point for you when the right role comes along. How do you find new talent? Do you have time to go and see theater, shows, improv? Comedy. Festivals. Com I go to comedy. comedy. Yep. Yeah. Question here from Paige. Um, when should an actor have a manager in addition to their agents, and can you give examples of how they're effective in advocating for an actor? I think that's a personal choice. Everybody's situation is different. Yeah. I think your agent is the one that helps you with that as well. Like, it's not really us. It's a, if your agent is like, you know, there's a great manager for you, you know, I think that that's sort of, or if a manager that you connect with, that that's a good choice to, if it's somebody that you feel like you can work with. Or if your agent stinks and you need a manager to help push it, that's another way. Sorry. Not to be negative Nelly, but, <laughs> but there are stinky man agents. <laughs> This question also doesn't have a name. Um, it says, as a new actor, it's hard to get started without an agent. What's some ways a newer actor can get called in for co-star roles? Um, they also mentioned, you've already talked about emails, but do you look at postcards? Um, and do you, how do you let an actor start a relationship with you? Yes, we look at all mail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do. And I think, again, actors access. Because yeah. when we put a breakdown out, go on there. Because we look at, we look at everything on the breakdown. We mentioned the list a little bit ago, um, but Christian wants to know, with all of you casting numerous projects um, and they have overlap, if time is not on your side, do you tend to have a group of actors that you turn to? I mean, look, I mean, I think you, we're human beings. So, you know, certain people come to your mind, certain people that, you know, you have, um, that you've known over the years or, but, you know, yeah. So, you know, we're human. Yes, people will pop into our heads. But every day, I think we're presented with new um, challenges, you know, whether it be a very specific kind of character, whether it's, you know, um, a, a specific character trait. So you're always looking. It just depends, like you were saying, it depends on what you have the opportunity to hire people for. And I can speak to our office. Like, you know, if we can have, on Glow, we have a lot of one-line co-star parts like that. If if I can avoid putting a breakdown out for a one-line part, I will do it because I don't want to go through 2,500 submissions for this one person. I'd much rather go to people that I've seen in a show or I've watched their web series or we know we've auditioned before. Like I just today went to the office and I went to a, the CBS Diversity Showcase last week and I went through and I added these people to our our, da our internal database of like, we've kind of pre-read them because we saw them work. Great, let's remember them for when they uh, we have something small that we don't want to put a breakdown out for. How important is branding and social media? <laughs> I'll, I'll take this one. Um, I think that it's important, absolutely, for you as an actor, you um, using social media to um, brand how you are presenting yourself to the world. I will say, I get asked this question by actors all the time, if it's down to this actor has two million followers and this person has 20,000 followers, are they gonna hire the one with two million followers? I have never, on any project I've ever worked on, been asked, nobody gives a Nobody cares. <laughs> Nobody cares, David. Nobody cares. Um, I will say how we do use social media in our office is if we, if we are getting to know you as an actor or 
we will use social media to see how you are presenting yourself to the world and what sort of messages you are putting out there. Just because, you know, when we put our stamp of approval on you for our producers that we want, we're saying hire this person, we're saying they're a good actor, they have the craft, they can do this role, but they're also a good human being and we're sort of giving you our seal of approval and sort of that covers us if we look at your social media to just make sure that it's all okay. <laughs> Fantastic advice. Um, this question says, why does casting always say we went in another direction when reps follow up instead of providing more specific feedback? They did say, I realize there's not enough time in the day for everyone, um, but do you ever have the opportunity for actors you consistently call in to give them more specifics than that? I think it really is. It's just in another direction. I mean, I think... I think it's again like I think some you just don't get a role because of so many reasons and it really is another direction. Yeah. It's like you can't t talk about someone's performance in the room because it's sometimes it's not about someone coming like the, the, the little boy that you mm -hmm. said cried and did you know and didn't get the part. It's not. It's just they went in another direction. Right. <laughs> yeah. And and I also think you know the negativity of I'm going to give everybody notes like oh you screwed that up or I didn't yeah. like that or uh, <laughs> like I don't you know what it's it's no, yeah it doesn't help them it doesn't yeah it's not helpful to an actor you know I think it's putting more you know shame and shadow on them than necessarily you know people need to have you know because there's nothing you can do about it. Like, no, I mean, gone. like, I can't give you feedback that you can then do another take of it. The yeah. role's cast and yeah. it's not helpful. Yeah. Live in the present. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's the best piece of casting advice you have ever gotten and who was it from? I can do this because she's sitting right here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think just learning and growing from, you know, at Betty Mae with Mary, um, she always, I'm going to steal your line because you always give this advice, is, is in an audit, like an audition shouldn't be perfect. Um, f finding the essence of the person, you know, getting to know that person, seeing moments is sometimes more positive than really specifically nailing the audition. Sometimes if someone can just nail an audition, that's all you're going to get. Um, as opposed to s f making the choices, as we talked about earlier, and finding those many things that you could maybe bring them back for something else, like, oh, this person's really right for this, maybe they weren't right for this, or convincing your team that they can do it if you work with them a little bit more. I think that is, as a casting director now, the, mo the best thing I've learned from her. <laughs> <laughs> Else? I think mine was on the very first day I started um, on the MacGyver pilot with Liz and Tannis Fowley, who's also a casting director in our office. Um, casting takes as long as you have. And you can cast a pilot in five weeks. We've cast a pilot in 14 weeks. Yeah, two weeks. I mean, it, casting, it's, it, casting takes as long as you have. And you will always go up to the very last minute. Yeah. <laughs> Every time. Well, to wrap up here, can everyone go down the line and mention um, the one really key piece of information you want the actors to walk away with tonight? <laughs> one closing thought or sentiment, piece of you knowledge start to impart. From that end. <laughs> <laughs> You're up, Lindsay. Ay, ay, ay. I know. That's a lot of pressure. I know. Um, I don't know. I feel like we covered so much tonight. Um, I think. Don't lose your passion. Mm -hmm. This is a really tough business. And I think y'all are in maybe the most tough position because there's no consistency. You, I'm sure a lot of you have other jobs, you're struggling. And I think it really can beat you down and you can lose sight of why you moved here and why you're pursuing this path. Um, and just to always try to remember why you chose it and to continue trying to do it regardless of the obstacles which i know is much easier said than done um but you know one of our perfect example one of our assistants um she moved here to be an actress got a job in casting um we work 
a lot, a lot of hours. She has done no acting since being here. And um, we went to New York and she went to Broadway and she was completely inspired again about why she moved here. And, you know, didn't want to sign up for the Groundlings and didn't want to do this and that. And we were like, you just have to do it. Make time to do it and, and get that back. And I feel like she almost got her power back and her inspiration back. And that was really nice to see because it is tough. So that's my only, I don't know if it's cliche, but I see so many actors just get beaten down and, and, and just remember why you chose to be an artist and try to fulfill that in whatever way you can. Yeah, don't give up, you know, just keep trying because I just do believe that if you believe in yourself, that's what John was saying earlier, it's about confidence and, and knowing that if you believe in you, we can believe in you. And, we want, we want you to succeed. Yeah, uh, everything they said. Um, because I think that we have all chosen to be in an industry that is weird and <laughs> unpredictable and emotional and it, it, there's no straight path to success for anyone. And you, I mean, you just said at the beginning of hearing how we all got into casting, none of the stories were the same. Um, Focus on the things you can control and the things that you do have power over. Be on time, know your lines, make a choice. I mean, I think if you can, if you can just remember, that's all I can do. Those are the things I can do and not worry about how the, how the rest of it's gonna work out. Trust that it will work out and that you're learning, doing your craft and continue to be inspired about why you're here everything they said <laughs> and then i'm just going to do this my email address is my name l-i-n-d-a dot lamontane l-a-m-o-n-t-a-g-n-e at gmail.com you email me i will have something for you to audition for because i have several things coming so because, 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 you, are, because you are in this room it's linda l-i-n-d-a dot and my last name, Lamontagne, if you know who the singer Ray Lamontagne is, he, 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 he's made my name easy to spell. So L-A-M-O-N-T-A-G-N-E at gmail.com. And just say you were here and in the email. Brief email, though. <laughs> <laughs> and read the specs <laughs> and label. Um, I guess, I would, you know, yes, I would say it's confidence. I would say, you know, that's the thing to remember and to walk in with. Um, and, you know, look, I also think that there's, in a world where, you know, victimization is run rampant and personal responsibility is kind of, you know, out the window, um, nobody ever said being an artist is an easy path, you know? Um, uh, it's not, you know, but it is, if it is your calling, then that is the road you walk. You know, whether you're an actor, whether you're a visual artist, you know, um, uh, whatever it is, you know, painters paint, actors act. And so I think that it is about not giving up. It, it's not expecting, you know, resentments are a hard thing to have, you know, and to carry with you. And if you're walking into rooms resentful, why am I not? Why am I not? Well, what can you be? And, and it is about, you know, um, controlling what you control, showing up when you can show up, and, um, and being present and being confident. That's all you can kind of do. And, you know, you turn the rest over to the universe and, um, and trust. It's all any of us have, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And, and we're all independent. No, you, no. Um, uh, we're, all, <laughs> <laughs> we're all independent <laughs> casting directors. Um, <laughs> And, and, you know, we trust, we trust every day there's going to be another job. I mean, our, our, you know, our existence and our, you know, um, careers mm -hmm. are much like an, uh, an actor. Mm -hmm. You know, we are always looking for the next gig. And, um, and we have to go through that same process of meeting people and auditioning ourselves and talking about ideas. And so, you know, it, the more you can control fear, I think the better off you are. You know, this town is run on fear. You know, you're afraid you won't get a job. Agents are afraid they won't get, you know, a booking. On and on and on. I, I truly think, I think most of my day is just controlling fear amongst people. And, um, 
And it's the same for an actor, you know, but we go through that same process and we're all human beings in it together and, you know, here to help one another. So um, I would just say confidence and control what you can and um, and know that it's, you know, it's it's not a it's not a guaranteed, you know, as Stanley Sobel said to me when I started at the taper, if you want security, go work at a bank. <laughs> You know, none of us made those choices, yeah. you know? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, little Miss Disney. Let's hear about it. I don't have a contract. I have at-will employment. They can cut me at any time. Um, I just... The, Find the joy in your process. Just, you know, it's not worth it if you're not having a good time. I just love my job, and if I didn't, I, I wouldn't do this. So if you're not having a good time, find something else to do. Yeah. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Congratulations again on your nominations, and best of luck at the ceremony next week. Thank you. Thank you.